Ben? Yeah, I see you too, yeah. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to our next webinar. And here we are with Darren Bolding, the CTO of Cambridge Analytica. Thanks for joining, Darren. It's good to be here, nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you too. Uh, Darren and I go way back. <laughs> so, uh, Darren, why don't you just uh, do a brief introduction about yourself, uh, what you've done in the last two years, because you've had a, a quite interesting ride. It's been pretty exciting. Uh, well, right now I'm at Cambridge Analytica, but I just before that I was at the Army as CTO for this election cycle that we just finished up. And uh, before that, I was with the Walker campaign, uh, his presidential campaign out in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, actually before that, I was with the RNC for about another year. So basically went to the RNC out of Silicon Valley and, and Seattle startups and then went to the Walker world, came back to the RNC, and now I'm back in the, the wonderful arms of the commercial space. So. Since you worked on, obviously, we have a new president, uh, and now at what, like 120 days or so. So, tell us about that experience about, about working on a presidential campaign. I, I worked on one, you worked on one. It's definitely a, a, a very exciting ride. It's an experience like you'll never have. If anyone ever has a chance to do it, I mean, it's uh, it'll take everything you have out of you, it'll it'll test your your family and your personal life and your own health, but uh, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done, um, professionally at least. You'll learn so much, you'll make friends that you'll, you know, it's, you're kind of like you've been through a, a battle with them together. Uh, so you build just amazing relationships and you learn so much about how politics works and everything else. I think that's just on any campaign and at the presidential level, you know, you, you're really a part of something special and unique where you have such a, a reach of, of the tools that you build and the, and the projects you work on. Uh, and, you know, hopefully it's with someone who you can genuinely believe in and support or you wouldn't be there. So it's, it's just an experience unlike anything else. Even, even when I was on startups that, you know, eventually went IPO and those were incredible experiences and amazing and, and just, you know, you learn so much there as well. A presidential campaign just dwarfs all of that. So, so let's talk about some of the the stuff you made uh, at uh, for the uh, the the Trump the Trump presidential campaign. Uh, did you, you built something with bots, right? Y'all were one of the first people to build uh, use bot technology. Yeah, yeah. So we actually uh, did some work where we actually made a Facebook bot. So uh, if you messaged uh, use Facebook Messenger to message. Trump's page on Facebook. Uh, we would do NLP, natural, Langu natural language processing on that and respond back. Uh, we also did quite a bit of stuff to actually get new people to engage with Facebook Messenger. And so we had very good uh, lift on that, as you'd say, from an advertising perspective of managing to get people to engage, people to come back again, to get them to talk about issues that we thought might be relevant to those particular people, to donate, to register to vote, to uh, sign up to volunteer. Uh, it was very effective. And you know, we even put some Easter eggs in there where if you said certain things, we would respond back with stuff that we thought might go viral. Uh, and you know, I had people, I didn't do, I, I'm in the role where I don't do so much work anymore. I kind of point and wave my hands and other people make everything happen. But uh, we had some really good success with that where if you ask the bot about Harambe, for example, it would give you back a very entertaining response. And so that went viral on Facebook and on uh, uh, Reddit, actually. And we were getting pretty amazing numbers of new signups organically every day as a result. So that was really exciting to see that take off. And we did that the last two or three weeks of the election. So would the bot, like, would you find supporters online through like lookalike audiences and then would the bot actually message people or was it like you pointed people who are already your supporters to talk to the bot and then like you said Hillary Clinton they would respond lock her up or something like that it, it didn't quite say that uh, but it, <laughs> it was vetted by the lawyers but there were you know it was very it couldn't just be a self-learning uh, neural net type bot that could say things that you might not want it to say so uh, it was more the NLP part was relatively naive process of monitoring based on the content of the message that came in. And then the responses were ones that were already pre-approved that we 
were comfortable with them going out. Um, it was mostly targeted at existing supporters. We also did some stuff that, you know, we're not going to talk about too much yet, I think, uh, where we went out and found ways to get other people to, uh, to, to ask them to message with, to, be, to add them to mess, Donald Trump to their messenger. So I don't know if you know this, but it, even if you're not friends with somebody, you can get a message to somebody and they'll get a prompt to opt in to receiving messages from you on Facebook Messenger. And we found a way uh, that we were able to add a lot of people to Facebook Messenger that way that we thought would be a target audience for, for wanting to talk to Donald Trump on Facebook. So going off of the fact that Facebook now released this new uh, basically bother your your congressman app, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the town hall feature. The So do you think things like Facebook Messenger or, or bots or this new uh, town hall feature are going to be more widely used going forward? Do you think Facebook's trying to own now that space? Um, I think Facebook's trying to own it. I think a bunch of people are trying to own it. Uh, I think just generally speaking, there's going to be a lot more personalized communication is the future of campaigning and hopefully civic governments as well, right? It's like, why should you need to go through and call your congressman or write your congressman or even email your congressman when you could have something that's in, like, why not use a bot for all of these things, right? Why not have it where you messenger to your, your congressman? A bot can understand the particular subject that you're wanting to talk about, you know, issues that are popular in the news, and let you register your opinion one way or the other, let you add your specific comments that you think are, you know, particularly relevant to the conversation, make it more efficient for the end users, the customers, as you would, the voters and constituents, but also make it more efficient for the actual elected officials to receive the content. And then they can do analytics on it much more easily because they've already got it in a nice organized electronic form. So I think that's kind of the future of things. And right now, Facebook is the top platform for that, right? But you could see how you could tie these things in very easily with Twitter or SMS or any other thing that might come along in the future. Like, why not have it where you can Slack your congressman, right? Yeah, if only Slack was allowed in, in actual Congress, right? Uh, <laughs> and they're still they're still catching up. They still have Lockheed Martin email, so I think uh, uh, anything would be an improvement over that. Uh, so so let's that bad. I thought they had gone past the uh, the specific email program, but anyway. Yeah. Th so let's go into uh, uh, the data that you used on 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 the campaign. So so what? Because I mean that's obviously what Cambridge focuses on a lot, and, and is a large part of of campaign expenditures now is figuring out like what data to buy. Uh, so what data should campaigns collect uh, about people? Well, the short answer is, is as much as you, people are willing to give you that you can legally and ethically get, right? Um, the biggest elements are not just the basics of, hey, you're identifying information, your name and phone number and things like that. You should be tracking if you have the resources and there are tools out there that can help with that. Uh, you should be tracking the activity on your site. So if you have content up, uh, if you have organic traffic, that's traffic that just people are, you know, visiting on their own, you should be, that's very rich to tell you the, the interest that that particular person has. And that allows you to identify that person, even if they haven't given you their information, it is Bob Smith in Iowa, but you'll know that it is a unique individual and that they visited your site three times and they seem to access this particular content. That gives you insight into what subjects they're interested in. Once you are able to find out more about them as an individual, then you can match that with offline data. And you know, Cambridge would be happy to help you with that and help you build up models around uh, where we use data science to come up with ways to predict the behavior of that person and the interests of that person so that you can then go back and reach out to them to try to get them to take whatever action it is that you need them to take, whether it's to register to vote, to sign up to volunteer, to donate, or you know, to sign a petition or contact their congressperson, any of those sorts of things. So a lot of it is, is collecting what you already see when you interact with people. Um, there's also lots of tools out there now, especially on the Republican side. We've got a pretty diverse set of vendors that do this uh, for allowing you to do canvassing. We're actually walking up to doors, going door to door and collecting information. All of that information uh, can come back into your own systems if you're 
an actual, uh, you know, if you're running and affiliated with the Republican Party, then that all goes back in, if you're using the right tools, can go back directly into the RNC's database using an API that my team built a few years ago and we continue to develop and use throughout the campaign quite a lot. So there's a lot of tools out there now that allow you to collect information about people, whether it's from their email interactions with you, their online interactions, or offline of them contacting you or you contacting them. Is there, of all those possible data points, is there any one of them that stand out to you as, because you know, when you're doing an analysis and predictive model of, of what, what influences people, you usually prioritize certain ones you find are the leading indicators. So are there, are there any leading indicators that you've seen? Well, I mean, when you talk to someone and they tell you what their interest is, that's a pretty strong indicator. Another really big thing that we did a lot of is, is petitions and surveys where you send out an ad on Facebook or target audience to get people to take an online petition or survey where they're saying, tell Congress this or tell them this or I support this, or for them to answer questions uh, to inform people. Uh, and look, you, you do that in a way where you're clear about who you are and what you're doing. People like to have their opinion given. Um, I would frequently laugh because I would see my more my friends that are more on the left who certainly were not supporters of Trump or the RNC, you know, were filling out surveys and organically virally sharing surveys that we had created um, to collect information on people uh, and their interests. And of course we do pass that on to who we say we're going to pass it on, but we also use that information to help inform ourselves about the electorate and what people are interested in. So I was thinking that I saw more viral sharing of our surveys from people on the left than on the right. Yeah, that makes sense. Explicit saying I am interested in these things versus passive monitoring, uh, browsing, browsing behavior. So once you have collected all these, the, this data, uh, what, what do you, uh, at least let's, let's say like what you did on Trump campaign, like what, what should campaigns do with those things? Well, you take it back and you put it into a system, a database of record, right? And so that's where some of the stuff we did in the campaign, and, and part of it is, is we had to do this very quickly because the RNC became involved with the campaign later in the cycle than it normally would. And because of the nature of the Trump campaign, they were not as invested in the sort of technology infrastructure. So we came in and helped quite a bit there, and we built out a tool called Alamo, or the, the database behind Alamo, and all of the integrations with various data sources that we would pull in through from other actions that people were taking throughout the campaign and throughout the party. So you need some system like that. You don't need to have a system built by you know the team we had to build out something custom like that. There are tools out there like Salesforce and other CRM tools. There are tools like uh, Nation Builder, the HubSpot, there's a lot of different choices you can use in this space. You pull all of that information back into one source, and then you can use it to make easy decisions of, hey, these people told me they're interested in this, but you can also use it to feed back into your data science program if you've got a data vendor. Uh, obviously, you know, Cambridge did quite a bit of this. So we would take that data, we would use that to inform us not just about that particular person, but by finding out if you see patterns of people who have this one characteristic, people have told us they care about issue X. We then can go find other attributes we know about all of the people who told us they like issue X and find the characteristics there that predict whether or not someone cares about that issue. And that, that's a very simplified, extremely simplified version of what data science actually does with modeling. You then can take that and project that out over a larger group of people. If you found out that people who have category, uh, criteria one, two, and three of their interests or their, their, uh, some attribute you know about them demographically or psychographically or otherwise, you know that about them, you then say, oh, if they have these three attributes, they seem to be you know, much more likely to care about this particular issue. Now that lets you create a model about that. And the way you inform that model is by doing surveys and getting first party data. You don't have to know it about the person you're going to talk to. You need to get a representative sample of people so that you can then project it out. And so with the Trump campaign and the RNC, for example, there's significant amounts of polling that goes on, polling and surveying that goes on on a regular basis. That's not just to tell you what's happening in a particular state or what's going on with the electorate 
uh, in a descriptive manner. It's to get you the information about those people so that you can then make predictions and make them more widely. And that's, you know, it's into the whole way that you were able to predict what states might actually be in play and came up with different results than what the public polling might be saying. It, so was Project Alamo used not only for outreach, but it, like as in online and offline for canvassing, was it Project Alamo also used to inform like where we put overall resources as well as a campaign? Uh, well, Project Alamo wasn't, Project Alamo wasn't just the data, the database and database system. It was kind of the whole team that was doing digital and data and all of that out of San Antonio. But the Alamo database in particular was where we kept all the information synchronized from all the different campaign sources. And that went into the modeling that both the RNC and Cambridge used. It went into uh, lots of decision making. I know one of the things that Cambridge did, or it was before I was with Cambridge, uh, but we were all together in San Antonio. One of the things that Cambridge was able to do was obviously, uh, and the RNC both, were predicting uh, the different states more accurately than what you could see in the public polling. And then also, that also helped inform, for example, where to suggest that Trump might want to have a rally, right? So you want to go for a neighborhood or an area that he's going to get enough support that he can not just pack the arena, but have a giant crowd waiting to get in. But you don't want to just go to a place where it's full of entirely supporters. You're actually trying to get people who are either on the fence to show up or people to see that he's in their neighborhood. A rally has effects beyond the people who are actually attending the rally. So you find this sweet spot uh, in, the, in the physical map of where to go because of the people that might actually be in the area. So all of that came out of Alamo uh, and also other data sources that we had throughout the RNC and the campaign and, and Cambridge's own proprietary stuff. So, so in, the, in, in the day of the election, uh, I mean, I think everyone was, uh, generally probably everyone was surprised, although some people say that they predicted it. Uh, but, but it definitely, my reading of the people who worked, I mean, Hillary's campaign was absolutely, you know, floored and shocked, but mm -hmm. that within the, the Trump campaign, it was more of the one going into election day that it was going to be closer than what the rest of America thought it was going to be. Uh, that's kind of what I've, I've read. Was that your experience as well? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I was thrilled and, and, and surprised. Uh, it was not the way I expected that we would win, but I thought it was going to be a lot closer than what people were saying. And for example, we had, Cambridge had had some models earlier on that basically said if he wins Florida, his chances go dramatically up to winning the electorate. And that has to do with, but also had to do with the demographics and other characteristics of the electorate in Florida that if he's carrying that sort of state that has that population, then he's going to do well in North Carolina and, and so on and so on. Another example was, you know, the folks inside the campaign and, and such were much more confident about Pennsylvania than you would have thought from the public polling and obviously thought that Wisconsin and Michigan uh, were in play. In fact, some of us that have a lot of Wisconsin background were sort of almost refusing. It, it's one of those things that's like, no, of course we're not going to win Wisconsin, even though the data modeling is showing that we have a decent chance there. We know Wisconsin. We know that we know who can win in Wisconsin and who can't. And uh, you know, we never win presidentials in Wisconsin, so obviously we're not going to win Wisconsin. Well, turns out we should have paid more attention to what the math was telling us. Because in the in the final days, uh, Trump did a I think he did a rally. Right? One of his last rallies was in Wisconsin, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We knew we were closing. Right. And, you know, and these were decisions that were made way up by people who were consuming data, not just from Alamo and all this other science and Cambridge's prediction from all kinds of places where they're synthesizing it. This was just one source of the data that goes into it or one source of information they used uh, to, to make those decisions. I don't want to imply that it was us saying this and they went there or anything like that. It was just, you know, one voice of many. Yeah, it, it, just with any making any business decision, it's a combination of data plus instinct plus people's own. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, so but let's go back to the to uh, you know you you drop in uh, from the RNC. Uh, the nature of Trump campaign as is pretty widely covered. 
was pretty heavily focused on advanced or events. Uh, wasn't heavily focused on building out technology infrastructure like there was uh, in the Clinton campaign, let alone they didn't have the resources, didn't have the time, didn't have the manpower. Um, so what is it like, you know, jumping in and, you know, you're an engineer, uh, you believe in agile, you believe in lean methodology. Uh, how does that actually work in such a fast moving, crazy environment? It, it actually ended up working pretty well. It helped that uh, several of us that were there had worked together on the Walker campaign or at the RNC. So the technology team, just because of the nature of go on for, there are reasons why this happened, but a lot of the people who worked on the Trump campaign had actually worked together on other campaigns that might've been for very different candidates. Uh, but we were all kind of together in one spot. And so those existing relationships actually helped very a lot. It helped a lot to have actually done similar things before, like the experience that my team, because several of them came with me from Walker, uh, and, and several of the people from Cambridge had been on Walker as well. The experience we'd had there trying to solve the same technology problems nine months earlier or whatever was actually incredibly valuable. The experience that we'd had building those sorts of platforms in the 2014 cycle of actually learning what political data looks like, learning what the political environment looks like, understanding the nature of how you should talk to a political person, a person who's running the polit in the political division of the RNC, or someone who's on the campaign staff, who have very different bases of experience than you do about how to communicate with them, how to express things in ways that will convince them, how to make yourself more useful to the general purpose of, of the campaign. Having that baseline was extremely important. It also meant that several of us had gone through and implemented Agile, uh, specifically Scrum, at the RNC and at Walker, and then we could do it in the, the campaign environment much more effectively uh, because we'd already done it several times. We knew what worked and what didn't in both. There's a lot of issues running operational type things like DevOps sort of work inside Agile. There's just inherent challenges to the nature of the work. Uh, there's also inherent challenges to the nature of a campaign to doing something in an agile method. So by learning that ahead of time, we were kind of able to get over some of those pitfalls. And and the biggest thing is is just being prepared that sometimes it's all going to go sideways. You know, you have your sprint planning and you're going to have your daily stand up and then you're not going to work on anything that wasn't in sprint planning. Well, guess what? That just isn't going to be your reality every week. It's not frankly going to be your reality any week. There's always going to be something that has to come in. So you have to tune the process to allow for a process where people can come in and say uh, that they uh, want to uh, use, a, sorry, someone was just trying to get the conference room. Um, you have to change the process to allow people to do that. So I may, have to, I may be getting kicked out of my room. Hang on a second. No, really? <laughs> yeah, even though it was reserved. But let me go grab a conference room. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so we'll, hey we'll get a tour of the Cambridge office. <laughs> Should we be saying that now Cambridge has job openings if you want to apply? <laughs> we do, yeah. in fact. Um, so, so the uh, the well, so the one 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 of the things I wanted to ask you was about. Uh, you said sometimes things go sideways. Is there any uh, from the campaign any funny horror story of uh, something going down or something someone hijacking? Uh, some script on the website, anything you can share? <laughs> there's a few, many of which, there's more than a few. Uh, let's think about when we can actually share. I think the, the biggest one that certainly is public is uh, during the first debate, uh, Hillary Clinton said, go to my website and go to my website, and that broke the website. <laughs> so there's uh, just traffic volume? Is it? Yeah, it was just a massive increase in site in this in the load on the site. Uh, you know, 
if you're looking at a traffic graph or any other graph of resource, just an asymptotic spike. And we had done, this was pretty early in from the time that the RMC was helping out with things. So to build out a solution where everything gets cached on a CDN and where while you're collecting that information that you need about each person that's unique and you're storing that in a database in a system, but that you have a way of handling when there's just not enough database capacity to handle it. You know, these were running on the largest AWS database instances possible. Um, and plenty of people will say, well, why weren't you using a NoSQL, you know, some structure that could scale more aggressively. Part of it is, is we're using existing platforms that don't have, have technology stacks that only work with certain databases. And we're not going to go in and change the campaign's uh, existing website infrastructure overnight. So, you know, you just, we didn't have it scaled up. We had it scaled up pretty much as much as you could, but we ran into load problems. It also didn't help that someone, uh, it, well meaning, they had put an emergency change to the website that increased the amount of web tra the traffic to the database eight times more than it would have normally been, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, things are gonna happen outside of your control, right? You're gonna need to launch something on debate night because there's going to be a good reason that something new should go live on the website before the debate. And guess what? Human beings that are tired are gonna make mistakes when they write code sometimes, and they're gonna increase the number of database calls and you're not gonna be able to scale up to meet the demand. If you're Hillary Clinton and you've had a year and a half to build out an infrastructure and you've got you know, all of this stuff already set up, great, you should be able to handle a spike in load and your site should be designed to handle more elegantly. If you've been there for basically a month and you're still trying to make sure the site's still secure and and, and, and you're trying to save money and be lean and efficient as well, then, you know, you, you might have the website go down. So I think we had basically one outage over the entire uh, general election cycle, and it was for 10 minutes or seven or eight minutes. Uh, it just so happened to happen in the middle of the first presidential debate. It was kind of a bad time. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, I remember, got to, I remember actually remember going to the website and I was like, oh man, this sucks. Uh, so, so the so something that happened between uh, you know 2012 to 2016 was this autopsy report where people were talking about what do we need to do to win again, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it'd be interesting to take your to get your perspective on whether or not those things actually in the end really did matter because I've been watching you know the or did watch before Chairman Perez took over the DNC and many of those same conversations that the RNC had in 2012 were basically the same conversations that the DNC is also having about technology, reaching out to these people, doing more grassroots. And, and I think that some aspects of the, the autopsy report was actually fulfilled in some kind of strange unknown way, which was that because the existing campaign didn't have all of the stuff, they had to use the RNC stuff versus if it was more of an established campaign like Jeb's campaign, uh, it was had all these things already were sort of already in place. So I'll be curious to see what like what do you think about what we thought the RNC said it needed to win versus actually what came out. I think it actually made a big positive difference, and you know those of us who were involved early on in parallel labs and such, we and you know some of it, it's a lot of uh, self uh, criticism about gee we you know we got a third of the work done that we really should have gotten done right. And there's all of the uh, problems of any organization of getting it stood up and started. But the, 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 the moonshot effort that started after that, Rebus and, and Mike Shields and Katie Walsh and everybody else stood behind, uh, that level of investment, both in the digital and the data, and also it, you know, the technology part that I was more involved with, uh, I think it really did make a difference. It built up of people, so it, it gave an opportunity for people to come and be involved, right? Paran Nepani, who's now the CTO at the RNC, was my deputy uh, from the, he and I started at the same time at the RNC back three years ago. Obviously, and the investment that was made there. I wouldn't have been there without that 
Jason, a bunch of other people, including people you and I both are friends with, uh, wouldn't have been involved if we hadn't just building up the capacity in terms of people that, that are identified as being interested, have learned something about politics, and have brought the technology to it, made a big difference. On top of that, you have the things like the API that we built, you have the data science that helped, uh, the RNC data science that helped with the campaign, you know, and the Cambridge data science obviously played a very large role as well. Uh, the, the building of the voter file and enhancing that, which, you know, that's what Cambridge used as the base for its voter database was the RNC data. That's what every candidate was going to use. They may have had access to other alternate sources as well. The RNC voter file is probably the best, well, anyway, many, many people would argue it's the best voter file out there. Some, some people might disagree with me on that. Um, so just the, the baseline infrastructure that we built and the people we built made a large difference. This particular presidential candidate, now president, um, you're right, because they were not national campaign, when it became time that they needed to scale out, it was even more valuable for the RNC to have done the legwork ahead of time. Us to immediately step in and be able to help. And if we hadn't had that experienced group of people, it would be much more challenging for the campaign to have gotten what they needed done done. Because the growth from when you are a nomination and then the interactions you have from a technology and systems purpose, uh, a point of view, once you are the nominee, is just astronomical. Right? And anything you were doing when you were in the primaries is not going to hold up in all election. And so that entire team, all the stuff Brad Barscale had already been doing, had to scale up and, and with that experience helped a lot. So I, I genuinely think overall it was very successful. It's helped build out an industry. It isn't the end all be all. You're not going to get all of your tools and services from the RNC. Not today, some of the services that you need, and you've got the expertise built up as a result. The, how did the uh, team structure change from when you, from like, I guess, candidate to uh, or getting the nomination uh, to general? Uh, what did the team size grow from like 20 to 100, or was it a more uh, gradual? increase to election day? I mean, I wasn't there with the Trump presumptive nominee, but I was one of the first people to fly down to San Antonio and actually, you know, talk to Brad and his team. At the time that we got there and they were already had been trying, trying to grow, you saw a, it's kind of a, like if this is the starting point, you see, or there to start being a real ramp in acceleration and growth. And part of that was just applications that are going to occur between any nominee and RNC around the resources that we could bring and also you know, discussions inside the campaign about who was going to do what. Um, and you know, some of that was publicly made about who was doing what. Uh, and so it took a while for it to settle down. But once, it, once people realized what we needed to do, it basically became anyone, any resource we can bring to bear uh, what, what, what was available. Uh, frankly, I think if people had just shown up in San Antonio and said, we'll work for free for basically, they would have put them to work and within a week or two, if you were any good at your job, you would have a job on the campaign or on the RNC. People just didn't know to show up in San Antonio, which may be a good thing. Also, they weren't interested in doing it. There were a lot of vendors that you know, refused to, to help out for various reasons. So um, one of the, uh, that kind of does get back to one of the things that we did right. We've made plenty of mistakes, that's for sure. But right, is when I first started the RNC, back at the RNC as CTO, was just we have to bring people on even if we don't have direct projects for them. Because having a team of DevOps people and developers that know how to work together, agilely together, that have just with good experience, 
having that capacity available busy for the first few months that they were there. But when the time came that they needed to be ready to help out on Trump's campaign, they were ready and they knew how to work together and I didn't have to go find them. They were just latent capacity that I could throw into the fire immediately. And it wasn't a very big team. It was only a small number of people. We didn't have, you know, a hundred person digital department and technology department. We didn't have 12 people building the app for the Trump campaign. We had one vendor that had two developers on it and, you know, one developer on my side. Um, you know, Jonathan Dietz basically ran Trump's websites along with myself and Jason Berlinski. That was the people who kept the website running. I mean, there were outside DBAs and things like that, but it wasn't this giant team. It was just a small team of people who I like to think were very, very talented at what they do and were very motivated to make sure that we had a Republican elected president. I think one of the unique things about the 2016 election that isn't as widely covered as the fact of, you know, that President Trump won uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, is the amount of money that was spent compared to Hillary, like all right dollars, and the size of the teams and how drastically yeah. different both teams were. It's almost like the, the which is lost, I think, in the conversation, is like the Trump campaign, uh, 2016 campaign, was almost a, the internet, like the way you build things on the internet, like as in the size of, of, of uh, Instagram's team versus the amount of valuation or size of Uber's team amount of valuation. It's like basically technology is creating more wealth and more power and more leverage. Uh, and you need a smaller group of people to actually do those things. And it's like the Trump campaign yeah. actually did that in many ways. I think so. And it was, you know, processes got developed and sometimes people in my role like processes because they keep websites up longer and they make, you know, make my team not waking up in the middle of the night uh, screaming as often. Uh, but frankly, you just need to be responsive, right? And, and having multi layers of, 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 of administrivia or administrative bureaucracy is not an efficient way of doing things. I mean, I think there was a study came out on the, on the Romney campaign. I don't remember how many it was, but it was like 12 or 20 people needed to approve a Facebook message or a tweet before it could be sent. I can tell you that Brad Barscale could tweet what he wanted when he needed to because the, the president trusted him to tweet for him. Um, you know, uh, and Danny Scavino could do the same. So there weren't as many of these processes and fairly quickly it became clear that, you know, when Parks Bennett who ran the mail campaign at the RNC and basically, well, they did run the mail program for the presidential campaign, the most successful low dollar program in history I mean, he had a higher percentage and more donors that were low dollar than Obama, uh, more than Hillary Clinton and uh, uh, Bernie Sanders put together. Uh, that, you know, basically it didn't take that long for people to figure out if you wanted to do something with email, you let him do it because he's really, really good at his job. So it's a, and that's classic in Silicon Valley or in startups, right? You find that a small team of two or three people can sometimes very frequently can get a whole lot more done than a team of 10 or 12 people just because of the inherent network communication effect that you have. Well, well so that's interesting that, that within the campaign that you all had basically a, a pretty flat model. I mean, there's obviously people in charge of certain things, but you know, as my experience working on the Romney campaign, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it definitely was. Uh, I remember the story of when I talked to my friends that worked on the Obama campaign in 2012, like the number of people who were actually responsible for Twitter at Romney, like responsible, was about two, two times or three, three times larger than, than Obama. Like there was like one person or something like that that would actually manage the whole account. But in our campaign, we had review of review of review. Yeah. And, and there's, I mean, look, there's, there's something to be said for a minimal layer of process, but it gets in the way, and that's a very Silicon Valley and startup ethos, and frankly, it's a, a I would argue, more Republican slash libertarian ethos, right? Is this less bureaucracy, less administration, more flexibility, more ability for you to sink or swim on your own? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, I know we have a few minutes remaining, right. so why don't you tell us about your new role at Cambridge? Oh, sure. Yeah. So 
you know, Cambridge played a large role in the presidential cycle this year. There's been a lot of questions about that and discussion about that. But, you know, the reality is, is that Cambridge did play a significant role. And, it, and I got to work with people and see them in, in the line of fire, as it were, see the data scientists that were working on the project in San Antonio and the digital people, uh, you know, some of which I knew already. Uh, and I just came away extraordinarily impressed with the caliber of the people and the talent and, and what the direction of the company was, both in political activism or political action, as well uh, in the candidates we support uh, or work for, and then also in the commercial space. And I'm very interested in getting back to the real world and doing real work of actually and services that are useful to people. Um, electing people to look at it to office is fantastic. It's important. Uh, it's exciting, but as an office of use to anybody, you haven't actually contributed to the economic vitality of the country, right? So it's, I think it's actually a higher calling to go up and do commercial stuff than to uh, be purely in the political space. And so Cambridge gives me the opportunity to do both. We work in political campaigns and supporting political organizations. And then we also are working on doing, uh, bringing those sort of things to bear into the commercial space. So examples of that are, we'll be working on, my key role here is, is actually making products. And so we're gonna be rolling out over the course of the next year, hopefully a couple of products that helping people uh, manage their data, augment their data, um, bring new value out of their data, uh, bring the insights that we can provide with the data science and the models and the technology that we've developed, our own intellectual property. Um, and then a few other things that help, for example, with the digital marketing where you work, we do, of applying the data science more effectively, I should say, to digital ad campaigns. And I think those will have applications both in the political world and the work we do there, as well as in the commercial space. I about it. I think it's it's to take this uh, all this stuff that we got to work on and develop over the last couple of years and turn it into something that is isn't just a set of tools and a toolbox that we can kind of glom together to solve whichever problem that we're seeing that day, but an actual set of products that website and running a credit card and well well thanks a lot darren for joining uh thanks for sharing your knowledge uh as uh you know thanks for sharing what, what happened in in the trump world and you know best wishes on your new career at cambridge well thank you and likewise thanks for all the work you guys do at lincoln of uh, helping connect people and you know I'm, as you know i'm a as I get settled in here in New York a little bit more, I'm actually really interested in, in helping you guys out more on that. Ideas cook along about how I help people get involved in the political space. Yeah, absolutely. You're to, uh... Oh, go ahead. No, I say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's important work you guys do. And, and it's really been valuable to that. One of the top people I've ever worked with, I found through a personal referral from from you actually right that's how I met Jonathan so yeah um, it's, it's been very valuable and it's it's made a difference in how you can actually the technology uh, movement if you will that's around the center right and the GOP uh, but if anyone out there if, if is actually interested in you know if you've got a DevOps background if you use AWS if you use that infrastructure if you've done front end development or you've done data integration and uh, data platform work, I have, or even just generally just software development, we have roles open for all of that. Managers, uh, user experience designers, we're hiring probably five or six people here uh, in relatively short order so that we can really start building out these products. So it's a, it, if you're interested in, in, in the opportunity to be a part of some really cool technology we're developing and also a chance to just learn a lot about data science by being around data scientists, uh, it's a really good opportunity. So just let us know. No, absolutely. So uh, people, you'd be able to find uh, Darren's contact info on uh, the web page that we have for this webinar. Uh, thanks again, Darren. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Take care.